Welcome to Q&A Selling Online with answers to questions about creating an online empire, promoting products, or building a brand. Your host, private label and e-commerce entrepreneur, Quinn Amorm. Welcome everyone to the show. Today we have a digital entrepreneur, co-founder of Squid Pixels, Steve Adams. Steve, what's happening? How you doing, Quinn? Thanks so much for having me on, brother. It's a pleasure to have you here, Steve. Founded Squid Pixels. Well, I want to know why you picked that name. Yeah, so the name came, comes up pretty often. And my wife and I, back when we founded it in 2015, we knew that we wanted to have a mascot that could anchor the brand in people's minds. And so I got up really early one morning doing my morning routine, and I had this book of mammals and animals all over the world. And I just started flipping through it, flipping through it. And, and I didn't make it all the way to S, right? That was, I didn't go that far. I made it to cuttlefish and I saw that cuttlefish squirt ink. And we still use hand drawings and ink in a lot of our design process. So when I saw cuttlefish squirted ink, I'm like, that would be cool to have that relationship between ink, but a cuttlefish wouldn't be a good mascot for a brand. <laughs> so I thought, oh, an octopus would be great but octopus don't squirt ink. So that led me to the squid. And then obviously pixels stands for the digital portion. And uh, we thought it sounded really good together. And um, it wasn't long after that, that we, we came up with a tagline for the brand, which is, it's, it's hard to say verbally, but it looks really good in print. Yeah. It's, we know ink, like K-N-O-W, we know ink, we know digital, but we know calamari. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a we have a family uh, vendetta, I guess you could say that none of nobody in our family is allowed to eat calamari when we go out to eat. Uh, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, so, so you mentioned that your wife is your co-founder. Yes. Yep, we are fifty fifty business partners. So and fifty fifty life partners. So we do everything together in the business. Perfect. That, that's super cool. I like that idea. I'm trying to get mine actually to, to get into the business with me, but it, uh, it seems to have not been going as well for me. But, uh, so how do you, you guys have to work together every day? We do. Then, we do. We work together side by side and, you know, sometimes folks come to us and they're like, you know, why don't you guys divide and conquer? Wouldn't it be more efficient if one of you was here and one of you was there? But we really enjoy doing everything together. We just went to a franchise expo this weekend and there were two shows right next to each other. One was like a health and wellness expo. We didn't know was happening, but we literally just went to the first show all together. And then the second show all together. Like we just, for us operating side by side makes us stronger rather than dividing and conquering, if you will. Yeah, oh man, that, that's perfect. I really love that. I don't know. It is kind of a dream of mine. So um, I envy you in that side. And then I also want to know, how does it work for you? Is it working fine? Do you guys, because you are uh, personally attached, does that, does that influence the business? You know, that a lot of people have said to us in the past and even on an ongoing basis, that they're like, I don't know how you work with your spouse. Like I can barely take them the amount of time that I have versus the fact that we are literally together all the time. I had a job many years ago where I was traveling and I would leave on a Sunday night and I would come home a Thursday night and then I'd be home for a week and gone for a week and so on and so forth. So we've been apart as a couple, but with this business, we are literally together all the time. And of course, do we have, you know, uh, discussions, if you will, <laughs> that, that a good board of directors would have with their members. Sure. But I wouldn't trade it for the world. You know, I think that for her and I, we created squid pixels. It's privately held by us 50, 50 partners with no interest in investors and no interest in selling. Now that doesn't mean that we don't build the business to be scalable and sellable for revenue purposes, but we want this to be a legacy business. We have three kids and that gives us three chances for one of them to take over the business when the time comes. Yeah, that, that's amazing. So now let's get into it because I know Squid Pixels is taking off super fast and it's a very successful brand, but it, it can't always everything be perfect, right? So did anything go wrong? Well, it's kind of like something that went wrong. 
I don't know that I have some epic failure that I can share off the cuff, but the truth is that we fail every single day. And so when you say like, what's your biggest failure? That's literally the first thing that comes to my mind is that we fail every day, whether it's missing one component of our morning routine or not making the follow-up call or sending the follow-up email that we thought we should, that we knew we should not sending that thank you card, you know, not hitting the revenue goal numbers that we have. We have thermometers up on the wall with goals of filling up the thermometer to make it hotter and hotter like it is where you are now. Um, and I, I honestly feel like we fail every day, but when we do fail because we're together, it does make it easier to, you know, people talk about like Gary Vee talks a lot about self-awareness, right? Yep. So if I'm an entrepreneur by myself out in the, the cold, if you will, mm-hmm. and I'm alone, everybody knows entrepreneurship is a very lonely game. I have to be self-aware enough myself to recognize the failure and learn from it. But I have a partner that's in my life and my business that can recognize that failure and be like, you really need to pick it up. Like that's, you know, or vice versa. I can do the same thing for her. And so that failing every day is how we just recognize it, adjust from it and continue forward on it. You know, does that make sense? Oh, perfect sense. Perfect sense. And I love the answer because that's probably the reason why I don't have, you don't have a huge failure is because you're able to see those little those, those little fail fast, right? Those little failures that don't allow it to grow into this huge failure. So it, that's yeah, what I, I like. If I had to pick out like specific failures just for the benefit of the audience, then I would say one of the one of the second things that come to mind is we failed at starting this business sooner. <laughs> yes. I wish we, I wish we would have started much much sooner, um, and. I had another one in mind that I was going to share that, oh, there, the one thing I would say to me, it's not a big failure because again, we adjusted course corrected and moved on and and kept going. But when we originally released squid pixels, we had this price point that I won't even mention now, but it was, you know, an obscene price point that we still have some clients grandfathered into that is completely unprofitable, not profitable (laughs) at all. And so, you know, luckily our growth with the proper price points has been fantastic um, to where we want to honor that for those original clients. But we even changed the name of that price point to the beta plan after the fact, just to know like, hey, this was like a mistake back in the day. And even the customers can see it on their credit card. Like you're on the beta plan. So don't cancel because we will never give it to anybody else ever again. You know, so that was a pretty big, that was a pretty big failure. Oh man. So I, I know we, we've all been there. Most entrepreneurs, when they start a business, any kind of agency consulting or anything, because we start with like anything in life, we start with the zero clients. We yeah. try to make it appealing to them. And then when it actually comes to the fact, we know like, okay, I am giving my time away for free. Just, <laughs> so. Well, and in this case, we had designers that we were paying more than what the client was paying us, you know, so talk about upside down on those accounts, but, but we, we shut it down pretty quickly. I think it ran for about six months and with, in our first six months, that was our goal was to be a six figure ARR or annual revenue or annual run rate business within six months. And so we went from zero clients, zero revenue, zero business, zero brand to six figures uh, a year in six months. And that's when we took a step back. Uh, we took uh, what we call a co-founders retreat uh, over to, where we go to? Hilton Head, I believe. And we, we went to Hilton Head and literally only put our toes in the sand one time at sunset on our way to dinner. The rest of the time we had locked ourselves in the hotel. We had a great view, but we were locked in the hotel and just running numbers and doing research and phones off. And that's when we came to the conclusion that those accounts were not profitable and we, we shut it down that Monday when we came back. Wow. And uh, from what I know, Squid Pixels does not have outsourcing. So you're paying, uh, you're paying American rates to, to, all those, to all those designers. So that's a big thing. Yep. That is, that's one of our cornerstones. You know, I, I came from a military family. My dad was in the army. And so... For us, it was, and we have other family members that are currently serving the country. My, my younger brother's a police officer. And so 
we, you could say we're very proud to live in the United States, regardless of what the politics and things are that are going on. We feel very blessed to be in a country that's as developed as ours. And so we want to be able to provide jobs for designers here, not to keep jobs from designers overseas, but also for the communication barrier. So in our processes, we have a lot of quality checkpoints and our retention is really high because our quality remains high. As soon as we start hiring designers from outside the United States, there becomes a communication barrier or a cultural barrier where if a client requests a shirt for an ROTC program, which is a military U.S. military program, then that designer that is in India or the Philippines or Australia or any other country is not going to understand that lingo. And it doesn't necessarily have to pertain to the military. One of the examples I used to give was if I have a client come to me that says, Hey man, I'm opening like this surf shop in Cali and it's got like this vegan hippie vibe. Can you design me some shirts? Like (laughs) that may sound funny, but the truth is somebody in India is not going to get it. Right. Um, and so one of our, one of our goals is actually to create a hundred jobs for designers here in the United States. Wow. That's impressive. That is impressive. So, um, let's get into this and explain to me how this works. How does Squid Pixels work? What could, what could I, for example, as a client, what would I be able to expect from you? Sure. So Squid Pixels is what we call a graphic design support agency. So you've probably heard of customer support, tech support type companies, we offer graphic design support. And the first thing to clarify there is that we stay in our lane, which means we don't do video editing, we don't do websites, we don't do email HTML, we don't do anything that moves, right? We don't do magazine layouts, we don't do logos, brand new original logos for companies, and we don't do complex illustrations. We do graphic designs for print and digital media. And so those are the designs that most small business owners, agency owners, and franchise groups are using day in and day out, and they have to get them done, right? So that's important. We stay in our lane, and that's the support that we offer. The second thing we did was when my wife graduated as an animator and designer from the Art Institute of Atlanta, she became a freelancer as well as worked for some other companies. And... At the time, I was the publisher of a local magazine, and I had worked with a lot of small businesses getting their artwork. And what she noticed and I noticed was inconsistency. So the small business owner, the agency owner, they're working together, but they bid out the job of doing design work for this flyer to one person. And then they need a rack card or a postcard, and they let the print guy design it. And then they need their logo touched up or social media graphics. And they go to their brother's, sister's, uncle's cat who knows how to use Photoshop, right? But they get it done for free, so it's all good. And none of their materials or assets look consistent and professional. So we said, hey, what if we made Squid Pixels a membership program where we had different levels of membership? And so our clients choose the level that fits them best based on output. And they pay a monthly fee to us for us to assign the request that they send in to our design team. And so those different levels, for example, we have one that's kind of the starter trial base level is for one piece of design output per month. And so that might apply to a church or a nonprofit that just has a newsletter or, or one monthly event, right? But for most business owners like you and I, that wouldn't be enough output. The second level is for a design a week and a design a week is perfect for the dentist or the plumber or that, or the realtor that has one event or one thing that they need each week. And that's about the maximum bandwidth they can handle because they have so many other things going on. And then our cornerstone product is the basically a design a day. And so we operate Monday through Friday, eight to six, Um, and we can push one design out every single business day for the clients that have that membership and that make, um, that keep their request queue full. And so that might be a social media management agency that needs graphics for lots of different clients. It may be an agency owner that's doing Facebook ads for one client and a lead gen ad for another client and things like that, right? Updating a Facebook group owner 
updating their banner or whatever, an author that's on book tour. Um, these are all examples of, of clients we have, right? And then we have a premium level that has a lot of extras for priority support and same day turnaround and things like that. But on average, our turnaround time is next business day um, for all of those things. And so being made in the USA, um, having very transparent pricing that's based on output, um, and then having the systems and processes that we do allow us to tell people, like, just give us a try. You're definitely doing graphics <laughs> in some way, shape, or form in today's economy and society. So why not insource it and let our team take over? We have no contracts. So they can change their membership level or stack memberships on top of each other for greater output any given month. So they're never locked in to something like that. So I think that's kind of the, the core components of what we do. Okay. So I just have, when it comes to that, I have one question. When you say graphics is, for example, a, a 3D rendering of something, is that a graphic design? So that would fall under the scope of what we don't do, like okay. CAD, CAD drawings and 3D renderings because it's going to move, right? A 3D rendering moves. And so that's kind of where I tell people the easy thing to remember is if it moves, we're not going to do it. <laughs> yeah gotcha gotcha and you mean, mentioned that yeah it was i was just going to say it doesn't mean that we can't do it it just means it doesn't fit within the scope of our systems and if we're on the fail fast podcast right like i think that that's one of the biggest things that's helped us succeed rather than fail is staying in our lane a lot of agency owners and a lot of young entrepreneurs try to do everything mm -hmm. and I was like that too when I was younger. You know, I remember at one point having this drawing on the whiteboard and between the MLMs and the affiliate marketing and my own ventures and, you know, investing in real estate and a, and a job, I had like a dozen things that I was doing all at once. And everybody told me, you got to focus, you got to focus. And I'm like, whatever, I have more energy than you. Get off my back. <laughs> but the truth is we could have done the same thing with design. We could have said, we do websites, we do SEO, we do... Um, all these different things plus graphic design, but we wanted to stay in one lane and focus and become the best that we can and the best that's available in that sector. Yeah, because you get to be the expert in that in that particular thing. So you're not the the guy that knows a little bit about everything, right? You you are the expert of what you do. So right, it's just perfect. I just actually. Mostly my stuff is e-commerce, which I've been doing right. for, for 20 years, 20 plus years. And recently I decided to, you know what, this is where the majority of the traffic is right now, the, 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 the low hanging fruit. And I decided to focus more on Amazon sales and Amazon right. FBA. So I kind of niched down to that and I stopped taking any, any kind of outside of Amazon clients. So, right. That is for the exact same reason. And how have you found it's helped since you kind of narrowed it down to that point? Well, it helps, for example, it helps a lot for me and for the team to not be running around yeah. uh, with all different resources and doing different things in different platforms because yeah. we need, depending on what platform you're working on, you need different tools so now right. when it comes to a point, I need to have memberships to almost any tool out there. Yep. Yeah, so when you're focusing on one niche, you get to be really good at it. Mm -hmm. and, that, and so you get to give your client a better, a better output of what they're paying for, right? So they get better results for, their, for that reason. Well, not only that, but you think about these entrepreneurs that try to do multiple things versus how kind of you and I have niched down into this one place. And you think about the scalability of it, because what happens is if you only do one thing really well, the intake, the uh, implementation or what the process that you're going through, and then the deliverable, all three become very predictable. And so like you said, not only is your brain space more filtered, but your team is using the same tools and resources over and over. And so it just allows you to scale, even like Amazon, for example, you know, their process is really simple. They have one site that has all of the data. You can search, do all of your thing, pick your thing, do the cart, all this jazz, and then it's delivered to your door as fast as they can 
humanly or robotically get it to. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, um, but they, they may have expanded into other businesses, but that was after they had that primary model that was predictable, scalable, and simple. Exactly. So I want to ask you about how you grew your business from, from zero to six figures uh, so quickly. What kind of tools were you using and how were you finding your ideal customers? Yeah, so that is a tough question and very. I'll, I'll try to give the best answer that I can. Um, most of the folks that are listening probably want to hear me say, oh, we had this beautiful Facebook ad and I'll send you a link and you can copy it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but we, we, have, we just started doing paid acquisition, actually. Um, we, have, we, have, we didn't do any paid acquisition in the first six months. It was guerrilla marketing, my wife and I, basically beating the streets, beating the phones and beating the emails, right? So between sending emails to family and friends, referrals, connections, past clients and other businesses, um, connecting with people on Facebook and Facebook groups, um, said cold, literally cold calling um, and going to events within associations or networks that we were a part of and literally just telling people, because at that time we didn't have a sales script. We didn't have any idea what we would do for Facebook ads. We didn't have any revenue for Facebook ads. Um, and so we literally just said, hey, let's have a call. Let's jump on a Zoom call like this one, right? Because in my previous life as a salesperson, I had to go to the business owner or to the homeowner physically. And this is so much more efficient. And so it was like, hey, let's jump on a call. Let me learn a little bit about your business. Let me share with you what we do in our business. And then let's see if there's anything that fits together. And I mean, I could have done that with you before we met and said, hey, you're Amazon FBA. I already know in my head that I can cut the background out of images with our team. We can do the merchandise posts. We can help you do promo posts. We can help you differentiate your products or offerings from all of the other similar products that are out there with really good graphics. Or if you're releasing a course or a training, we could do all the graphics for those things as well. But I can't just come to you and say, hey, can I do graphics for you? You know, here's our price. And I, I wouldn't have a chance to explain to you why we're US made, why we're a membership platform, why this consistency matters. But if you and I talk about your business and then I share with you my business and it's a good fit, great. If it's not, then at least I could potentially give a referral to you. Hey, I talked with so-and-so two weeks ago. Let me connect you with them. Or you could provide me with a referral. Um, and referrals did play a role in that six figures to six months. You know, we really love our clients. Our clients love us. We call it the squid squad. So we always put hashtag squid squad on uh, a lot of our stuff, but we always, whenever somebody signs up and we, they go through checkout and we do their onboarding, we always say, and welcome to the squid squad. Um, and so they kind of grab onto that and, uh, it's a great thing and, and referrals do play a role in that. And so, um, now we're in a place where we're doing a little bit of paid acquisition on, on different channels. Um, and just slowly ticking that up, but we're still doing the old school gorilla things that got us to the first six figures, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I like the squid squad because people <laughs> like belonging, right? So mm -hmm. when uh, just like John Lee Dumas has the fire nation, uh, right? Yeah. The fire nation and people like belonging. They like being part of something. So that's probably one of the reasons or one, something that helps you keep those, those, those customers with you. For sure. And we actually, we're in the process of developing a referral program slash affiliate program right now so that we can have, again, you want something to be predictable and scalable. You have to put a system in place, right? So we've been getting referrals and we've been getting reviews on Facebook and things like that. But now we want to turn it into a system. And so hopefully by June 1st, we'll have all of the development done uh, to, to release an affiliate and referral program. Um, initially, we'll probably only release it to existing clients, right? So not just open to any affiliate marketer that, that comes off the street, but for people that understand us, our system, they, that they love our team, those are the folks that we want to give the chance to, to earn a little revenue by referring us family, friends, and associates. Yeah, it sounds like a great plan. And uh, Steve, you mentioned that you were before you were a salesman. What was it? Um, what were you selling? So um, <laughs> talking about failure, right? If you ask my mom what my biggest failure in life was, 
my mom would probably say dropping out of college. <laughs> so I am, I am an official true blue uh, college dropout. Um, I, when I graduated high school, I was working on a produce farm. And so when I graduated, I quit, but all through high school, I worked on this farm where I rode my bike at sunrise, picked vegetables and fruits and crops till sundown and then ride my bike home. And so when it's time to go to college, I'm like, I'm done with this work. You know, I, I learned good work ethic, but I also learned what I did not want to do with my life. (laughs) So, but my summer job that summer after graduating, I walked into an office because they sent me a letter that said, you got good grades. You did well in school. Come work for us. And when I walked in there, I realized that I was going to be a Cutco cutlery knife salesperson, right? (laughs) Cutco kitchen knives are made here in the United States. I know you're in Canada. Yeah. Uh, And they are, they're U.S. made knives that are sold, quote unquote, door to door. Um, They're actually sold by referral. Nobody goes door to door, but that's what everybody envisions in their head. Anyway, so that, to speed up a little bit, that first summer, I was like the number three salesperson in the office. I remember I had a purple shirt that was like too big for me. I still had braces and um, did well enough to make like three grand, right? So going into college, that's good money. But the more valuable lesson was that uh, my manager became my mentor and my best friend who is still my best friend to this day. Um, and fortunately, he just got a kidney transplant and everything went well. So uh, he is, he's still rocking. But that relationship, he gave me the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. When I left his office and went to my first year of school, we stayed in touch. I continued selling knives while I was in college. And then spring break came. And everybody went off and did their spring break thing. And I said, hey, I'm going to go see my mentor in my history. He lived in Miami. So I'm going to go see him in Miami. And we went out, hung out on the beach for a week, had a great spring break. But while we were down there, we said, okay, this summer, I need to make money. I've got to pay for school. My parents had used their entire college fund only lasted one year at Virginia Tech, right? So I'm at Virginia Tech and my parents are like, if you want year two, you got to pay for it. And so that summer that after my first year in Miami, I worked my butt off under the guidance of my mentor, Andy. And I ended up going from making three grand over the summer to making 30 grand over the summer. And so that huge shift in income is kind of what catapulted me into the entrepreneur world because I was no longer selling individual sets of knives to Mrs. Jones and Mr. Jones in their home, right? What we did was we started taking and saying, hey, do you know anybody that owns a business? We can engrave their logo on the blade and they can give it as gifts to their clients, their employees, their partners for referrals. And that's why the sales jumped up so dramatically. And so I was number 10 in the nation that year um, for that sales organization. And long story short, I go back to school. I can't focus. I want to run my business. So I drop out, move to Miami and my parents, you know, hate me for a while. And that was the the start of my, my business career. Yeah. That's (laughs) That's That's a talk about uh, thinking outside of the box. (laughs) Right. Yeah, I gave me a lot of really valuable skills, you know. And so my wife, my wife actually sold Cutco because I ended up selling Cutco for eleven years, I think. And she sold Cutco. I was mentoring her at one point, and obviously now we're together. So that Cutco environment of being a salesperson was where we met. And the funny thing is that when you're a, a knife salesperson, you have a, what's called a demo kit right? Of all the knives in a suitcase. But when you're brand new, you only get like half a dozen knives to show and you've got to like earn the other ones or buy them, right? So we, we have a suitcase in the garage with every single tool that Cutco's ever made. That was my demo kit by the time I was done. And it's still sitting in the garage and our 11 year old daughter, the day she turns 16, she's going to training. <laughs> so that's where she's going to cut her teeth before she comes and works for us. Nice. Yes. Give her some, uh, some field experience. That's right. That's right. Very good. So tell us the story of when you purchased a book of business from, from a competitor, from another creative agency. Yeah. So we, 
I'm going to try and tell this story as best I can without giving up any information that my lawyer would get me in trouble for. Right. Okay. Um, so after we hit six figures in six months, we had, um, one of our clients come to us that had, they have an agency that does a lot of different things essentially. And after hearing our story, being our client for a while, seeing me on a couple of other interviews like this one, they came to me and said, Hey, there's this one chunk of our business that you guys would be really good at that. We're not good at, um, or they were good at it. You know what I mean? Like they weren't failing or, or delivering awful results for their clients, but they just, they wanted to do other things because they were better at them and they could charge more for those things. So it didn't make sense to keep this other book of business. And so it was just serendipitous where we started talking multiple zoom calls, multiple negotiations and settled on a price. And so we bought that book of business and absorbed that chunk of revenue and that chunk of clientele from that agency. And I got to say the transition went really well. Um, everybody, all of the clients uh, that were there transitioned over uh, pretty much right away within 45 days, I think. And uh, there were two that are like, yeah, two clients that were under contract with them that we delivered results for as part of the agreement. And when that contract was up, they decided to, to go their separate way. All of the other clients remained with us and are now on our membership with no contracts, right? So for us, it was a great experience uh, and we would probably look forward to doing it again in the future. <laughs> Very good. Another thing is most people always uh, try to look at the ROI of things, so the return of investment. Mm -hmm. You look at the return on time. Can you explain that? So return on time, I don't know. I'm sure somebody else used it at some point that inspired me, but I kind of came up with it during those first few sales calls when Squid Pixels was a, a baby squid, if you will. Mm -hmm. And what it was is that it's hard to express to somebody the ROI they're going to get from a design membership, right? Because unless you're doing a funnel and we're doing the little elements in your funnel, or if you're doing FBA and we're doing the pop images or something that's going to convert, like the, the image actually causes a conversion and you've tested the previous design and testing the new design, then there's no way for us to show ROI. Um, now, from that perspective, if you're paying a full-time in-house designer and they quit, or if you're getting ready to hire one and you look at the cost associated with payroll, payroll benefits, hiring, firing, training, can we give you an ROI? abso freaking right? Like <laughs> we would be significantly cheaper than that option, but it's still not an ROI. It's just a lower cost. So anyway, return on time to us is what happens when our mission is achieved. And our mission is to take graphic design off the plate of entrepreneurs, small business owners, agency owners, and franchises, so they can focus on revenue producing and relationship building activities. Because those are two things that you can't outsource, insource, or otherwise get somebody else to do. Revenue producing and relationship building activities. And so that's why you can see on the shirt, it says graphic design is none of your business. So return on time relates to the fact that if graphic design is not your main business, then why not hire somebody who it is their main and only business to handle it for you in the most efficient, professional, consistent manner that is affordable for you. And that doesn't just apply to us, right? Like you don't, there could be multiple layer Facebook ads. If Facebook ads is not your business, then hire somebody that you can trust that will run those Facebook ads for you, right? So return on time is a result of making sure you have key team members or key team service agencies like ours in place as part of your overall system that make you do what you're supposed to do with your time rather than things that are none of your business. Absolutely. I love it. And on top of that, there's another thing that you can kind of set, put yourself out of your own business in case uh, if when you want to go on vacations in case mm -hmm. you need to just uh, not too long ago I had an emergency that I had to uh, fly over to Europe and if you don't have those kind of resources like for example squid pixels to keep 
yeah. to do stuff for you, uh, your business is going to suffer when you are not available, right? Yeah. So if you're like the like I used to be, I used to be, want to run everything. I wanted to have a finger on everything, even if yeah. I didn't know how to do something. I would get somebody to do it, and I was trying to learn from them so I could do it. And like, well, that's wasting my time, and time is money, and I'll probably never going to be as good as they as they are. So, yeah, yeah that's. That's, that's exactly what we talk about. And so with our, in our systems and processes, we have a software that we use, a proprietary software, where our clients get access to this dashboard. And that includes, like, if you were a member, that would include you, as well as an assistant that you might have, or a co-founder, or partner, or editor, or somebody like that. And you can make as many requests as you want, and then your output is based on your membership. So... By making as many requests as you want, it stacks up in what we call your queue. So what does that mean? That means not only are we working all the time for you in the background, but it also means that if you're going on vacation or if you have an emergency, if your queue is full or if you pre-stack it like many of our clients do that travel, we will be doing work while you're not working or on vacation. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's really important because we have clients in Australia, Slovenia, Norway, Sweden, uh, Brazil, um, Aust Australia, uh, and of course, all over the United States as well. So, and, and if I get, for example, your, your daily output where you can get one design a day, what yeah. if, um, what do I have to do? Do I have to tell you? what my design ideas are or, and do those accumulate as well? For example, if I don't get 30 this month do and I only use 20, do I get <laughs> 40 next yeah. month? Yeah, that's uh, that's in the frequently asked questions, right? They're, they're not rollover minutes. We're not, we're not a cell phone company, right? Yeah. So it's, it's up to one design per business day. And so the reason we say that is because if you make a really clear request, and we deliver it the way you want it and it's approved, we can move on to the next one because we do everything one at a time. So it's almost like a production line. You put everything that you want on the line and we start working on them one by one. And so we don't have any limit on revisions. So if one design ends up going through a couple rounds of revisions, it may take two days or three days, but as soon as it's done, we're going on to the next one. So we do have some clients that like clockwork, they're getting a design a day every single business day that there is, which fluctuates between 20 to 23 business days in any given month, right? Mm -hmm. So that kind of gives you an idea of output. And that's why we made it that way is because we wanted to be really transparent about the pricing because there's a lot of organizations that talk about, in, in our sector, right, that talk about unlimited graphic design or graphic design, um, you know, Galore. Um, unlimited is really the, the word that they mostly use. And we even were originally going to use that word to describe our service. And we just wanted to be the most transparent priced company that we possibly could. <laughs> so to answer your question, when you are in our software, you can make those requests in the dashboard or via email. And you literally just tell us, hey, here's the title of my request. Here's what I want in it. And here's the size I need delivered. And then you can attach any assets that you need. Um, and in that telling us what you need, the only thing that we tell folks that is the most important is the copy. Because again, we stay in our lane. We're designers, not copywriters. So whatever the copy is going to be on that social media graphic or on that Facebook banner, then you would need to provide us that. Um, but you can attach as many assets as you want. So that means you can do what we call an asset drop or, or a brain dump. And you can say, here's three designs I really like from other competitors. Here's three that I hate. And here's three files with my logo and different things on it. And this is what I need. And over time, what happens is we stack all those files on our servers and your system. So our designers always have access to everything that you've done and we get a vibe for you. And that's when things start moving even faster, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. So for example, uh, you could learn who I am or what my brand represents. So you could just, uh, nice. It's almost as if you were part of my team, you know, what my brand represents and you would go from exactly. there. And I think the biggest thing to say there is 
a lot of agencies that do design work of any kind, whether it's web or graphically, they, they tout this idea of a dedicated designer, right? And we don't do that at all. And the reason is because if you have a dedicated designer that knows your brand and that learns you, what if they get sick? What if they quit? What if they get hit by a bus? There are a lot of things that can happen in the world and that your brand is not going to stop because that designer disappeared. And so what we do is we have two quality checkpoints. The first quality checkpoint is when you submit a request, we're quality checking you and saying, did you give us all the assets? Did you give us the copy? Is it clearly written? Cool. But part of that is also us deciding which designer on our team it should be assigned to. Because if you request a billboard, like a physical billboard banner one day, and the next day you request an ebook cover, those are definitely going to go to two different designers. They might go to the same, but it's very possible that we, this one has experience in billboards and this one has experience in ebooks. So we require our entire team to be up to date with the brand standards, brand guidelines of all of the clients. And then the second quality checkpoint is when they do that design, it has to go through QA on our side where the co-founders and the quality team literally review every single request before the client ever sees it. So that's why we can do up to one a day because by the time you get it, it's already gone through two or three revision cycles that you don't even know about, right? Exactly. And Steve, these would be completely unique designs, right? Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah, we don't use any templates or things like that. So I know a, a part of a, a market, which is the Amazon merch, mm -hmm. where people can design T-shirts, for example, and yep. sweatshirts. And all those have to be unique, and they have to be made in a specific program. So I could ask you, can you make something? Uh, you can also make it this size, and can you use this particular tool if needed? Yeah, exactly. So we can deliver all the different file types that you might need. The one file type that I think people have asked us for the most that we don't do is embroidery files like DST or DTS, I think it's called. Um, we don't do digitizing of embroidery files, but we do do vectorizing of logos and all the other file types. So FBA and, and Amazon, for example, those, all of those, the clothing entrepreneurs out there, a lot of them can start up, throw some things on a shirt, and if they know their other systems well, they can make money. If they hire somebody like you that's actually going to walk them through and mentor them in the process, they're going to do a lot better, but they should be aware of copyright infringement, right? Yeah. And I know there's stories out there of people that have gotten shut down because Taylor Swift <coughs> came in and sued everybody that used her likeness at, at any given time in the last decade or something, right? And sued like 700,000 people. I'm getting all the numbers wrong, but that's the, the first story that comes to mind. And so when we have somebody that's doing t-shirt designs, we know, okay, we have to use CC0 photography if we're going to use any photos and everything else that comes through this needs to be original. Same thing with book covers. We work with a publishing house, a Christian publisher that we've done every book cover that they've published for the last like three years or so. And those covers are getting printed thousands of times. So we have to make sure that the imagery that we use is original, that it's licensed properly, and that we're within compliance for copyright law. Yeah. And you know how uh, you mentioned that the, the copyright and somebody sometimes could create a lawsuit or something. Right. You know, I find that when you want to upload Uh, something today's algorithms are pretty effective that they won't even let you upload just by wow. kind of the keywords that you have in there. And I don't know if they go as far as tracking your design, but often I want to upload something and it fails. So well, they didn't mm -hmm. upload. There's some copyright strike here. So yeah. Uh, uh, and then sometimes I'm going through Amazon and I can see uh, designers that I have upload through merch. I uh, like, a Disney shirt. Yeah, that's clearly copyright infringement <laughs> to like the biggest brands on the planet. And you're like, how did you get that through the algorithm? Like, what are you doing? Exactly. So I know it's a matter of time till somebody reports it and uh, more than likely another seller or, or Amazon actually catches it or, or any other platform, right? 
But yeah, it's it's funny how they get through with some of those huge brands. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, and I think, you know, if you were in that situation where you upload a design and it gets kicked back, and do they give you any indication as to why it was kicked back or they just blatantly say no? Well, they it's it's a very, very blank statement kind of there. Yeah, it's there's some copyright in there and sometimes they can tell you what uh kind of what it's related to right okay so but it's never straight to the point well and the reason i was asking is because like one of the other things we do is unlimited revisions so if you're an fba person and you're uploading designs and they're getting kicked back you just come back to us and say hey it didn't work let's try this or let's try that <laughs> and one of the things that we do that helps reduce the amount of revisions and may help in this specific exam example for somebody uploading designs to Amazon is that when you submit a request to our team, we deliver two different variations of what we think you want. So instead of you saying, I need X, Y, Z, and we just give you X, Y, Z, we give you X, Y, Z and ABC. That way you can say, I like this one or I like that one. Ooh, I like this piece on left and I like this piece on the right. Let's put those together and make a third option that is exactly what I really want in the end. And so that could help those FBA folks as well. Awesome. Steve, uh, before I let you go, tell me what are some of your favorite tools that you use in your business? Holy smokes. Um, so my favorite tool of all is having my own Squid Pixels membership, right? Um, <laughs> my wife is pointing to her software. She's like Adobe Illustrator, right? That's the one you're pointing at. She said, Adobe Illustrator is my favorite tool. Um, no, I mean, legitimately, I do have my own Squid Pixels account for me as a co-founder because we've grown to the point where I can't just turn to my wife who sits next to me every day and say, hey, I need this design done You know, by the end of the day. I have to put it through the system and get in line just like everybody else. <laughs> and so yeah. I know I can get it next day, but I can't just get it right away. We've got systems that have to be followed because if it's not in the system, it won't get done. Right. I have had, you know, a family member reach out and say, Hey, can you get me this design real quick? And they sent me an email. Like it's not in the system and it's, it gets lost. But when you're a client and you're a member, you're, you have that access. So anyway, so that would be my favorite tool would be my own membership with squid pixels, Adobe illustrator and Adobe overall uh, would be our second most powerful tool that we use because that's what powers everything that we do, right? Um, and then our third one is the software we use is called JAR, um, jarhq.com. And it is a ticketing based software for creative agencies to use to, to manage the flow of requests, right? Because we get hundreds and thousands of dis individual design requests and it's what keeps them all in order and segmented by client and things like that. So, uh, and if anybody wants to know more about Jar HQ, it's a newer platform that was developed by one of my mentors, and I could probably get you a referral link or a discount code or something. Um, but Jar HQ is great, and then um, Bear Metrics is a good one that we've had for a while that is mostly for SaaS platforms. And it, what it does is it connects to your Stripe account and it takes all the data from Stripe of incoming payments and just makes it look really pretty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These really beautiful graphs that track everything. But the extra piece it does is that when anybody's card goes delinquent, it has automated email sequences that it sends them saying, hey, your card didn't go through, we'd like to get it updated. And gives us the ability to, when a client says, I need to change my card, so that we stay compliant and we're not in Stripe, you know, on the phone getting their card and entering it in Stripe, we just send them a link and they update it and it's tokenized for, for their account. And so Barometrics is a, is a great one. Um, but I would say, even though SquidPixel is my favorite, Barometrics is the prettiest, Adobe is probably the most powerful, and JAR is the most organized, the biggest part of our team is my wife and the designers that's the biggest tool that we have that makes us who we are because I'm not a designer. Um, they remind me on a regular basis that I don't know diddly squat about design, right? I, I studied architecture and, and industrial design and interior design in college, but I dropped out, right? So I don't have any weight to throw around in that department. Um, but if we didn't have the designers that are a part of our team that, that we love as members of our squid family, 
uh, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. And, and uh, they're the ones that I appreciate the most and the best tool we have. Pretty cool. And Steve, does Adobe Illustrator get any easier when you, when you know what you're doing? And I say this because I often get like packaging design for a new product that I'm going to launch. And mm -hmm. when, when they give it to me, sometimes I look at it and if it's in an AI file, yep. I know I can open it in Adobe Illustrator and right. I know how to, basically what I know is how to click with the mouse on the text and replace text. Right. Uh, and every time I look at that, I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> There's so many buttons, right? What is this? What yeah. do I do? So it's, it's interesting because I watch my wife and, and her team work in Adobe Illustrator as well as the other Adobe products all the time. About the extent of what I can do is go on Adobe Stock and download a properly licensed photo from the premium collection, right? Like, and again, I, I take my own medicine. Like graphic design is none of my business either as far as doing it. That's why I have my own membership. And so, you know, of course, whether we're on an interview or not, if you're going into AI yourself, that's a perfect time for me to say, you know what, Quinn, you should really consider getting a Squid Pixels membership because when you see that and you need something fixed, you send it to us and we'll get it done next business day for you at the latest. <laughs> yeah, no, I thought I thought it would be cool to learn it as long as uh, as well as Adobe After Effects. I saw somebody do some super cool videos, but that interest of mine lasted I don't know about a minute after mm -hmm. I opened that Adobe um, um, After Effects, and I'm like, oh wow, I'm getting out of here as well. So you know what I think is interesting is the the idea because this comes up a lot. Like we'll have folks that we're prospecting or that otherwise we're trying to court for a membership and they'll tell me, Oh, but I really enjoy, or I love playing in Adobe. Like they know it takes them hours of time that they're not as good as an experienced designer. They know it's not a good return on time. Like we were talking about earlier, but they're still doing it. Mm -hmm. And what I think is interesting is that these designers that we have spent at least four years in college or a university learning a trade essentially like we don't look at graphic designers or web developers as tradesmen like a plumber or a roofer or electrician or carpenter right mm -hmm. but they learned a trade and they were likely apprenticing with somebody that has also learned that software for years this is not one of those things where you can just be self-taught on youtube and have the design background the color theory the spacing and negative space and transparency along with how to use the freaking tool that has millions of buttons to do it, right? So I think if people thought about it more like a trade, they'd say, I don't want to learn that trade. But, and if I did, like, what, what else could I use that time on? Well, could I make my mindset better? Could I make my morning routines better? Could I, could I get more knowledge on the topic of psychology or selling or relationships or could I make my relationship with my spouse better instead of spending that time on learning that software you know one of the things my wife and I do is we start every morning with a morning walk together right we take the baby the dog we do a family morning walk every morning uh, right at the start of the day we have a green drink when we get back from that to make sure we all get our greens for the day we have all of our breakfast, lunches, snacks, and dinners planned out. So that way there's no thinking about food. And then, and we have a, a date night once a week. So that was the, the last thing I was going to share. So, cause I was talking about spend time on your relationship instead of spending time in learning a trade. Right. And that date night once a week has rules. Those rules are no kids, no friends, just the two of us for, you know, a couple of hours at whatever it's going to be dinner, no cell phone experience, no phones right? Other than to, for the kid notifications, right? But like no calling. Um, we both post on Instagram a little bit, right? So I would say it's not no phones, <laughs> but um, it's, it's light phones, if you will, no phone calls. Um, but that date night is like a religious activity for us every week. And I could be doing something totally different or learning a software or learning a trade, but that time is way better invested with my wife <laughs> and making sure we get time out of the office, away from the business, um, and so that, that would be my advice to anybody that is playing in one of those softwares is find something better to do with your time, unless you're going to make that your whole thing, you know? Yeah. So, 
That's very, very similar to mine, Steve. So uh, me and the wife, we get up, we work out, we have a, a vegan breakfast, then we take uh, prepared. Uh, one of the kids goes to school, so we get that right. kid to school. I I walk her to the bus stop, then we come back and work. Although we have twins, I, like you know, we have small twins, so <laughs> we can't both work at the same time all the time because the they. Um, I guess they don't allow us to. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, so we kind of take breaks there. And uh, yeah, one of my yeah. buddies, one of my buddies had twins about a year ago, and uh, they just had another baby. Um, so they have three now, but um, they they caught up to us. You know, we have three kids, and now they have three kids, and uh, it's they caught up really fast. So we have a little bit of experience in the twin world, and we don't. Um, I don't blame you for not being able to do. <laughs> things at the same time when uh, when you have to use both arms for both kids, right? Absolutely. Steve, I know you have to go. So before you jump out, uh, let everybody know where they can find you and Squid Pixels. Yeah, the best place to find us is squidpixels.com. Um, if you're, I'm not sure when you're listening to this, whether you're listening to it right when it releases or much later in the future, but in June, we're kind of in summer now. In June, we're going to be releasing our own new social media um, level of output. So I'm going to use my own account to create social media uh, graphics for our social media channels because they've been pretty empty for the last year. It hasn't been a focus. And so all of our handles are at Squid Pixels, right? Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snap, or, um, and Pinterest. They're all, whatever the title is, at Squid Pixels, right? So if you follow us on some of those channels, you may get to see us using our own account, taking our own medicine, starting to push out some graphics as we move into the summer. Um, and for me personally, uh, I welcome anybody who wants to connect, ask questions, partner together, or otherwise jive off of each other. Um, it's the Steve Adams. So Steve Adams is so simple that I just put the in front of it, and all of a sudden that handle became available everywhere. <laughs> so, um, so the Steve Adams is where you can connect with me directly. Very good. Thank you so much, Steve. And I'll make sure to have all of those on the show notes so, uh, so people can check it out. Awesome. Thanks so much, Quinn. No problem. Thank you.